Up next are Anne Holler, advisor, Chi Su, staff platform engineer, and Maduri Yachuri, founder and CEO from Aloddle Inc. They will be talking about the suitability of Kubernetes running on public clouds as a deployment platform for Ray. They will share experiments with Ray deployed on nodeless Kubernetes, the lessons they learned, and suggested best practices. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Holler, and I'm happy to be here with Chi Su to talk with you about some experiments we recently ran on Ray on public cloud Kubernetes. We'll talk about three execution environments in which we ran those experiments. We'll discuss the lessons we learned, and we'll suggest best practices based on attributes of those experimental environments. In this talk, we'll first introduce Ray, then we'll give an overview of the machine learning experiments we ran on Ray using the Ludwig ML toolbox. Then we'll talk about the three execution environments we used, the virtual machine execution environment, the Kubernetes execution environment, and the nodeless Kubernetes execution environment. We'll describe the pros and cons of each, and we'll wrap up with the lessons we learned and the best practices for based on the attributes of each of these execution environments. So what is Ray? Ray is an open source project that provides a simple universal API for building distributed applications. There's a number of different systems for building distributed applications, but typically they involve either very low level operations such as MPI or very high level operations such as Spark. And in either case, the way they're structured is very different than the way the original single machine, single machine code was structured. With Ray, users can parallelize existing single machine code by basically annotating their functions to turn them into tasks and annotating their classes to turn them into actors and making little or no code changes other than these annotations. And in this way, the distributed code is very much similar to the original code. And based on this, it's an increasingly popular way of creating and scaling um, distributed applications. Kubernetes can be used as a substrate for executing distributed Ray programs. So here we depict a deployment of Ray in its cluster form. We have, in this case, a head node and two worker nodes. The head node contains the driver, and the driver is what runs uh, the user's code uh, and manages its uh, parallel operation using workers. And here we have worker nodes, two worker nodes, and we have on each of these three nodes a Raylet system with a scheduler that's doing the local scheduling and with object store. And the way this object store works is for parallel uh, execution, uh, shared memory is handled as a sharded shared memory controlled by the global control store. And so each of the workers has a part of that shard that's appropriate for the local task being run on this worker. In this picture, we see a fixed size Ray cluster of one head node and two worker nodes. But Ray also comes with an autoscaler so that you can create, uh, you can have Ray scale up and down the number of workers uh, based on the workload that Ray is currently processing. Given the simplicity with which Ray can be used to take a simple uh, serial program and make it a distributed program. It has become very popular for machine learning workloads because data scientists tend to develop a machine learning model as a single small program on their desktop or in a Python notebook. And then later, when the model is more mature, to want to work with the full data set, which won't fit on a single machine. So given that Ray makes it easy to do that kind of uh, conversion to a distributed version, uh, it is really quite popular and hosts many of the state-of-the-art machine learning libraries. Uh, here's a recent blog post from Walid on how Ray is playing a strong role in third-generation production ML architectures. So one of these state-of-the-art machine learning libraries that runs on top of Ray is Ludwig. Ludwig is an open source project that provides a toolbox to train and serve deep learning models 
without the need to write code. And this is unusual because typically for writing uh, deep learning models, a fair amount of code needs to be written as well. But the way Ludwig avoids this is by structuring the deep learning models as three stages, the encoder stage, the combiner stage, and the decoder stage, and having each of these stages be implemented by standard uh, structures from lower level frameworks such as TensorFlow. Ludwig can utilize Ray to do hyperparameter search, so basically to take a model and look for different settings for running that model that will make it more accurate. Uh, Ludwig can also use Ray for distributed training. Ludwig Benchmarking Toolkit is software that's, in addition to Ludwig, sits on top of Ludwig. It's an open source project for running end-to-end -end benchmark studies. Uh, it can uh, take a list of tasks, including different kinds of deep learning models, a list of standard data sets, and a list of evaluation metrics to be gathered, whether they're standard such evaluation metrics like AUC or accuracy, or whether they're things like power consumed during training, and it can run those experiments and gather the results and present them. So we recently used the Ludwig Benchmarking Toolkit on top of the Ludwig Ray platform to run a hyperparameter search study um, using Raytune. And we did this across a set of tabular data sets. And if you've been following the deep learning community, you know that deep learning is considered to be well suited to uh, tasks like image recognition or natural language processing. But tabular data sets have proven difficult to handle for deep learning models. And we wanted to look at some state-of-the-art deep learning models that are intended to work well for tabular data sets and see how well they would work, particularly with a very deep set of hyperparameter search. And we compared three public cloud execution environments for these experiments. Um, we're not talk going to talk about the results of these experiments in this talk. That's a future blog from Ludwig. But we're going to talk about the public cloud execution environments for the experiments. Stepping back, before we compare the three public cloud execution environments we'll describe today, let's take a closer look at the experimental setup to clarify the use case we ran. As we mentioned in the previous slide, we trained deep learning models with hyperparameter search for 12 tabular data sets. Diving into those data sets, the 12 tabular data sets represented three kinds of prediction. Six were binary classification prediction problems. For example, is this transaction predicted to be fraud? Three were multi-class classification problems. For example, what kind of Walmart shopping trip is this predicted to be? And three were regression problems. For example, what is the predicted value of this Allstate insurance claim? These data sets were drawn from various public sources. Nine of them came from Kaggle, the ML competition site that has a wealth of machine learning data sets and interesting analysis. Two are from the UCI ML repo, another good source of ML data sets, and one was from gaussianprocess.org, another good source of ML data sets. In our experiments, the data sets were automatically fetched via name reference by the Ludwig platform. Ludwig supports automatic fetch of a wide variety of data sets, and it's easy to add more. On these 12 data sets, we trained deep learning models with hyperparameter search for the three tabular model types available in Ludwig. The first, data the first model type is TabNet, developed at Google, which uses sequential attention to provide interpretable tabular learning. The next model type was Tab Transformer, developed at AWS, which applies the self-attention method from natural language processing to learn tabular embeddings. And finally, we used Tab Concat, Ludwig's default model type, which concatenates the encoding, order, encoding layer output and runs the result through fully connected layers. We used the SKOPT hyperparameter search technique via Ludwig's interface to Raytune 
With respect to TabNet, we searched across 11 hyperparameters. With respect to Tab Transformer, we searched across 8 hyperparameters. With respect to Tab Concat, we searched across 5 hyperparameters. For each training job in the hyperparameter search, we ran up to 300 epochs, with early stopping set at 30 epochs. If you think this sounds like a lot of computing, you would be right. These were very long running jobs. And the table on the top of this uh, slide, we see the compute time hours per model type across all 12 data sets run in the AWS execution environment. In the sum column, we give the compute hours for running the full hyperparameter search for each model type across all 12 data sets. As you can say, these represent, as you can see, these represent weeks of computer time. And notice there's a big range in the time consumed per job. In the min column, we show the quickest single runs of each type. And you can see they consume half a day or less of compute time. In the max column, we show the slowest single runs of each type. And we can, you can see that some of these take as much as the equivalent of 30 days of compute time. So compute environments that can burst to accommodate high load at the lowest available cost and that can contract when the load stops are well suited to this use case. Now please note we've not run this full set of experiments across all three of the public cloud execution environments we're discussing today. We have run the full set of experiments on the VM cloud execution environment, that is, on the AWS execution environment. Specifically, those experiments were run on AWS on three node ray clusters with each node using g4dn.extra-large instances. This was our baseline experimental environment with which we were all familiar. We've run proof of concept subset of these experiments on the other two cloud execution environments we'll discuss. That is on the Kubernetes cloud execution environment and on the nodeless Kubernetes cloud execution environment. We're planning to run more experiments on the nodeless Kubernetes cloud execution environment given our positive experience with the POC. So now let's turn to focus on comparing the three cloud execution environments for running this use case. The first public cloud execution environment we used was running virtual machines in the public cloud. And for this execution environment, we used AWS EC2. Um, we used fixed size ray clusters uh, because we wanted to manage the costs and capacity we were using for doing the AutoML experiments, these experiments of searching for the best model. And we wanted to manage how much of the capacity versus the overall capacity of the organization we were using because the organization um, was also running, let's say, nightly tests and other kinds of jobs. We didn't want to use all of their capacity. We used non-spot instances for this work. Uh, the challenge with using spot instances was that we were using GPU uh, instances. GPU instances were very popular in our uh, region, and so we often weren't able to get any availability of GPU instances. And since we were manually running these experiments, we didn't want to try and fail to get a spot instance and then try again. That was just too tedious. Uh, so that's what we did for compute capacity, for storage capacity, and storage, shared storage capacity is needed for these experiments. Uh, these experiments create a data set cache for use by the different instances that are doing the hyperparameter search. They create checkpoints and they create experimental results, all of which are stored, stored in shared storage by the head and the workers. For this, we used AWS S3. So what were the pros of using virtual machines in the cloud environment? Well, it was simple. It was simple to configure Ray for this situation it was simple to use Ray in this situation. It's a common path for Ray deployment. This path supported a lot of low-level Ray configuration options, um, including setup commands. You know, we were running experiments with where the Docker we had uh, needed some other packages installed. 
afterwards, and it was easy to do that um, and easy to be dynamic about doing that. Uh, we were using file mounts for things like our AWS credentials or our Kaggle credentials. We could share the file, file mounts of a virtual machine in the cloud with our array deployment, and all of this was quite simple. So it was, it was a good environment. We liked it. However, it did have cons. So the biggest category of the cons it had were that basically the compute was hand managed. So we were manually tracking the number of AWS instances we were running with respect to the org's AWS limits and with respect to leaving some capacity for other kinds of jobs. We weren't able to flexibly choose the instance and market type, for example, the size and spot instance and so on, because that would have been too tedious to do manually. And as it turns out, we were making various vendor-dependent configurations in our system, which were, you know, making it hard, let's say, to move to a different vendor, you know, and this is something that's kind of natural uh, when you're using a system where certain things are easy to use. So thanks, Anne, for introducing us, Ray, and the cloud VM environment. I'm going to talk about the next two execution environments we have and the lessons learned from there. So the next environment we run our experiments in was with Kubernetes. And in this case, we chose the Oracle Container Engine, or OKE, to run the Ray uh, compute capacity. We also enabled the Ray Autoscaler to dynamically spin up and down Ray workers which are represented as the Kubernetes pods in the Kubernetes cluster. This is useful because resource demands of the job workload can change dynamically as the job runs. For example, in this workload, uh, training jobs on some hyperparameters may run faster and finish earlier than jobs on other hyperparameters. And of course, we need to reserve a certain amount of compute capacity in the case cluster to make sure the job can be scheduled while it's running. And we also switched from using AWS3 for the persistent storage to using OCS object store in S3 compatible mode. This is convenient, uh, convenient for us since we are already using the S3 environment and our code knows how to talk to S3. Um, but the S3 compatible mode is not a seamless plug and play from our previous code we do need to make some configuration changes for this to work. So what are the benefits of running Ray on Kubernetes? It was nice to have the automated tracking of instance usage within the org limits. Uh, so we're not sitting there with a spreadsheet tracking, tracking down how many instances uh, we are reserving for this hyperparameter search job and making sure there are enough, uh, enough instances available for other jobs. And the discipline of deploying our code on Kubernetes reduced the, um, some of our vendor's basic configuration. For example, uh, we can now standardize the S3 configuration and the Kaggle credentials for both AWS and Oracle in the same way. However, uh, there are some cons even uh, with moving to Kubernetes. Uh, again, we're still in a situation where we don't have enough flexibility in choosing the instance and market types. Before the job runs, we need to determine the types of instance for the job and how many are needed for each, each instance type. And this is a tedious thing to do to calculate manually and leads to additional operational comp uh, complexity. And even though we can manually calculate and provision these computes, it's hard to optimize the resource utilization. Um, the reserved resource is usually for the max demand of the job, but because the um, job demand uh, can change as the job runs, that max reserved resource is, is not used uh, all the time. Before I describe our third execution environment, um, I want to step, step back a little bit and talk about what a knowledge Kubernetes environment is, because our third environment involves the knowledge Kubernetes. So the idea of a knowledge Kubernetes is that it provisions a just-in-time cost-efficient compute for a pod. 
So if a pod cannot be scheduled on a Kubernetes cluster because um, either there isn't uh, enough resources available for that pod or uh, that resource type is not a proper type for that pod, Knowledge Kubernetes can look at the availability of the underlying um, cloud provider for proper resource uh, for that pod and provision the least expensive uh, instance type. And when the pod completes and terminates, uh, it also uh, terminates the compute associated with the pod. Uh, so, so the Kubernetes cluster doesn't have to be deployed at the max capacity it can be scaled up and down dynamically with the uh, demand needed for the job. Knowledge Kubernetes also works seamlessly with a variety of popular control plane vendors um, such as uh, EKS, GK, GKE, AKS, and OKE. So how do we use our um, with knowledge Kubernetes in our third execution environment. Again, we use the Oracle Container Engine for Ray uh, compute capacity. Uh, again, we are using the Ray Autoscaler to spin up and down Ray worker nodes, uh, Ray worker uh, pods in response to the resource demands of the job. Uh, but now we have the uh, knowledge Kubernetes component adding and removing nodes. Uh, to and from the Kubernetes cluster, and that's in response of the resource demand of the Kubernetes pods. So what happens now is that the Ray Autoscaler will see the resource demand increase uh, of the Ray job and places additional pods to the cluster. Um, and the knowledge Kubernetes components will see the resource uh, demand increase of the pods and the provision cost efficient nodes to the cluster. So what are the pros and cons of the third environment? Um, again, we still have the benefits of bringing uh, Kubernetes to the environment. Uh, we like that we still have the automa automated tracking of instance usage within the org limits uh, and the, uh, deploying on Kubernetes um, helps reduce the vendor specific configurations. Um, and now through known as Kubernetes, um, we don't, to, we don't need to calculate manually um, and uh, determine the capacity beforehand. And at the runtime, the Gnolis Kubernetes can uh, flexibly choose the instance type and uh, market type based on the demand. Um, and because the Gnolis Kubernetes scales up and down the nodes in response to the um, job, demand, job resource demands, uh, this, to, this leads to improve the resource utilization and the reduce the infrastructure cost. Um, there is some cons um, with the knowledge Kubernetes uh, deployment. Um, so there are majorly two cons we, we see. Uh, this is apparently another component deployed into the Kubernetes cluster and something else to be managed. Um, another thing with uh, knowledge Kubernetes is uh, rather than preserving uh, other other than reserving the capacity beforehand and having the capacity already available to a pod when when a pod is added to the cluster, knowledge Kubernetes act, uh, needs to provision a new virtual machine just in time uh, to respond to the unschedulable pod. Uh, in our experience, this can add two minutes to seven minutes delay to the pod provision time. And th this is not a problem for our experiment because machine learning training jobs are pretty lengthy uh, and can usually run anywhere from several hours to several days. So adding like a two minutes to seven minutes delay is not a huge overhead. Uh, but this is uh, something to keep in mind if you want to use Kubernetes, uh, a knowledge Kubernetes for your workload. So we can uh, kind of pick the knowledge Kubernetes environment as our top uh, as the top of our pyramid, uh, less um, operational complexity here and the fewer cost. So uh, stepping back, what are the lessons learned and the best practices? So we learned that we can run very well 
in a variety of cloud environments. So that is uh, uh, great. Uh, but we also learned that it's nice to choose the environment that's appropriate for your workload upfront because there are some switching costs. If you switch uh, from deploying on uh, AWS EC2 directly to deploying on Kubernetes, there are some differences differences in supported options that are available in terms of uh, um, worker setup commands, in terms of uh, uh, credential and the configuration management. Uh, if you switch between vendors, the vendor differences can be subtle and uh, addressing those differences it can be difficult. Uh, and we learned that especially with our S3 configuration. And thirdly, Kubernetes introduces some constraints uh, which are well-intentioned but different from a non-Kubernetes environment. For example, in Kubernetes, there is a GPU tint that prevents um, pause from uh, CPU pause from running on GPU nodes. Um, no such constraints exist if you directly deploy Ray on AWS EC2. Uh, and you can see that this difference is useful because GPUs are more expensive than CPU and maybe you don't want to run CPU pause on GPU nodes. Uh, but uh, it's a surprising difference when you make that switch. So deciding what you want upfront and going with that is useful. And when you decide upfront and choose the uh, environment for for your set of workloads, um, we think it's useful to consider um, several factors. So consider the um, uh, operational complexity, how easy um, how easy it is to get uh, get the cluster up and running. Um, uh, consider the um, uh, you know the instance types and the uh, availability of those in instances and of course um, uh, vendor dependency and cost. Uh, and among the three environments we run, we think the vendor direct environment can be uh, easy and quick to set up. Uh, Kubernetes brings in um, a standardization and uh, can reduce the vendor dependent elements uh, and reduce operational complexity and no less Kubernetes further enhance the um, flexibility and reduce operational complexity and the cost. Um, so in this work, we got a lot of help from the Ray community and the Ludwig community. Um, we uh, would like to thank Richard, Avanika, uh, uh, Travis, Piero for their support. Uh, and we definitely appreciate the Cognitive Rejects organizers um, Lexi and uh, Ashishu for organizing this wonderful conference uh, and then we appreciate the audience to listening in our talk. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.